Disobedient objects are the objects of art and design produced by grassroots social movements. Um, and this is the first exhibition that gathers together those objects from movements around the world since the late 1970s. Sometimes those objects uh, are everyday items, commodities that have been reappropriated and turned to a subversive new purpose, uh, like the cacarola, the lid banged uh, in protests in Argentina and before that Chile. Um, but sometimes they're new objects crafted uh, to create a new way to disobey. So something like the suffragette teacup um, or the graffiti writing robot, which are made for a specific new purpose. There's lots of these objects uh, and made out of very cheap materials um, and they might look quite strange in comparison to some of the fine craft that you, you get in a museum like the v &A. but we wanted people to try and understand them in their own terms that these objects are often produced under duress with limited resources with the threat of uh, you know attacks from the state but they're profoundly like impactful they've made great changes in the world and in that respect they're more powerful acts of design than much of the other things you would see in this museum um, we use the phrase that they're poor in means, but rich in ends. Many of the objects uh, in the exhibition, in fact the majority of them, were borrowed directly from activist social movements. Um, and one of the things about all of this material is that um, there aren't any professors, there aren't any particular experts in this material. The real experts are the activists themselves, are the people who've been using them and developing them uh, collectively. The apieros are craft items produced by women uh, first of all in Chile in the 1970s uh, under Pinochet's regime. So they would use them to find a safe working space together. They said that while their eyes were down and they were sewing, they felt with their hands concentrating on something, able to talk about the things that would happen to them. It made a safe space uh, to discuss the traumatic uh, things that had happened. So the apieros document the tortures, the disappearances, uh, as well as the women's protests against uh, those things that were being done to the community. Um, often they were smuggled out uh, of the country. Uh, initially they were regarded as folk art and as not understood as something political. Uh, but when the government realised the kinds of stories that they told, uh, they were outlawed. Um, if you look on the back of some of them, uh, sometimes they have a small pocket which a letter was slid into. And they didn't know who it was on, in the outside world who would receive the apiera. So they would write a letter to them to explain who they were, to explain what the story was that they were telling. And the tradition of making apieras spread. Um, so from Chile to Colombia, um, so we have other examples of apieras from different times and places, right up to recent ones from Ireland, from Shannon Airport, uh, which are about protesting against extraordinary rendition and the use of an airport in Ireland uh, to do that. Um, so the inflatable cobblestones um, were first produced uh, for a demonstration in 2011 in Berlin uh, by a collective called Tools for Action, um, who make inflatables for protests around the world. Um, for this one, they took an iconic uh, object of dissent in Europe, the cobblestone, pulled up from the streets and uh, thrown at the police. Um, but they also played with the misrepresentation uh, of protesters as always violent, always troublemakers. Um, so they made a very playful version of a giant cobblestone um, for the 25th May Day demonstration in Berlin. Um, and so this was taken along, um, played with by the crowd, it offered a focus uh, the, for a playful kind of atmosphere um, and eventually was th thrown at the police who, and the object is clever because it causes a dilemma for the police. Uh, you throw a giant inflatable cobblestone at the police and they can either throw it back, uh, in which case instead of beating up the anarchist, which they want to do, they have to play beach, beach volleyball with them because it gets thrown back again and it causes a, a new kind of feeling, a new kind of situation. Um, or they can try and confiscate it in which case they're in the position where they have to try and destroy or arrest a balloon, uh, which makes them look ridiculous. So you see um, there's some great film footage of the police kind of climbing on this thing and hitting it with their sticks. Um, and it acts as a kind of diversion that the, the protesters kind of wander away. Uh, and so, yeah, often uh, these inflatables are attacked and destroyed uh, by the police, but they, they change the atmosphere of, the, of a protest. They uh, offer some way to control uh, events and negotiate the space of what happens on the streets. Um, so, in the exhibition, we have some puppets from the Bread and Puppets Theatre, um, who are a group from Vermont in the United States, um, who've been instrumental since the 1950s in introducing and popularizing papier-mâché puppets uh, in protests, especially in America. Um, so, the, 
the, the puppets that you often see on US demonstrations are often people who've been trained by bread and puppets at some point, or they reference the traditions of making the bread and puppets use. The book blocks, um, they first appeared in Italy in 2011 um, during protests against cuts to education, the part of student protests. And they were shields which could be used to push back against police attacks and negotiate the line between violently or non-violently resisting the police. Um, so each shield was decorated as a book, so each student chose the book that would represent them and which would protect them, and they used it to push back against the police and the police's attacks and attempts to push them out of public space. Um, the other thing they did is they turned uh, the story of the battle, uh, the attempt to represent the event as a battle in the news media, into a battle over the story. They returned uh, all of those images uh, of the moment of confrontation to the reason that they were protesting. So they were very kind of strategic, very thoughtful. Um, so there are lots of newspaper photographs of the police attacking books, attacking students, holding up books to protect themselves. So the story of the protest was immediately returned in all of the media photographs. And the idea spread like a meme. Um, the London students saw these photographs uh, of protesting students in Italy and immediately saw what a clear and brilliant idea it was and began to make their own. Um, and it spread even wider, so students protesting in Manchester, elsewhere in the UK, uh, around Europe, uh, in Spain and in the US as well, in New York, in Oakland. Um, the idea spread and spread and, and now it's becoming an increasingly kind of a common strategy you see in protests, these decorated shields. Um, they're all quite humble objects and you see with the, with the uh, how-to guides, they're, they're not singular special artworks, they're things that want to be reproduced. Uh, their makers want you to make your own, to take that out into the streets. They don't want it to be something that lives only in a museum. Um, and when we brought all of these humble objects together, something happened uh, in the exhibition that we didn't exactly expect. Um, so they seem like quite small objects, uh, quite modest objects. Um, and they might seem like they belong to very small acts, um, but social change is made out of many small acts by people who might not necessarily know each other, like the book block makers, they might not necessarily even, ever even meet each other, but when they act together, they create a power that no state can repress. The truck, uh, the back of the room, one of the largest objects in the exhibition, uh, is completely covered in mosaic ceramics. Uh, it's created by a British artist called Carrie Reichard. Um, and this truck came about uh, because she corresponds uh, with prisoners on death row in the United States. And after writing to one man, Ash, for many years, he wrote to her and said, I'm going to be killed. Will you come and witness my death? Um, so she said she would. Uh, and she went with her friend Nick Reynolds, uh, who makes death masks. And they had agreed with him that after they watched him being killed by the state of Texas, uh, they immediately took his body with his family uh, to a cabin in the woods and made a death mask of his face. Um, and it was his wife said she found it a particularly powerful and therapeutic experience. Um, Texas is a no contact prison. So when you see those uh, images of people in TV shows and so on, so putting their hand up against the glass and not actually being able to touch each other, that's exactly the experience she and her husband had. She said the first time that she'd been able to touch his face in years was after he was dead and she was making a mask, like being able to put this, uh, the clay onto his face. So the death mask then was brought back to the UK and it's, been, it's mounted on the front of the truck um, to remember Ash and to protest against the death penalty. And the truck has been used in uh, marches, demonstrations and parades uh, around the UK to bring attention uh, to this issue. The Guerrilla Girls were a group and are a group of New York uh, artists and curators um, who in the 1980s uh, wore guerrilla masks to disguise their identity and draw attention to the issue rather than to, to themselves. Uh, and they protested about the representation of women uh, in the art world, uh, in galleries, especially in America. Um, so they would make large posters that counted uh, the number of nude women, for example, that are represented in the Metropolitan Museum in New York against the number of women artists who are represented in that gallery. And always the numbers uh, were very uneven. One of the interesting questions the exhibition raises is what it means to succeed as an artist or designer. Certainly for all of the artists and makers in this exhibition, it isn't about commercial success, it's about impacting on the world in a more meaningful way. The differences that they made to people's lives on the ground, the experiences they had, the friendships formed, 
um, the changes in their worldview and their sense of who they were and what they were capable of were a different kind of victory that history books don't often remember, but is much more important in the long run. Just because these objects have come into a museum, uh, it isn't the end of their life. Lots of them afterwards will go back to the groups that used them and back into the streets. All it is is an invitation for people to start paying attention uh, to the new kinds of making that are happening in social movements and get past some of the stereotypes that people sometimes have about what protest looks like or who it is who can be an activist. Because within this show it could be anyone from uh, a grandmother from Chile uh, to a teenager from New York.